Hello everybody, my name is Paolo Boldi. Uh, I'm happy to be here with you. Um, my, well, the overall title of my class is, is uh, Techniques and Algorithms for Modern Information Retrieval. Actually, the, the area is very broad, so I actually handpicked some topics that are, I think, were more suitable for you. In particular, I handpicked the topics that are more graph related because this, this school is all about graphs. Uh, and this is actually one of the main objects I work with. Uh, before starting, two things. First of all, in case you don't understand me, in case you don't understand my English, or in case you don't understand what I'm, what I'm telling you, please stop me, interrupt me. It's good for me because it means that you are not sleeping. Second, uh, I prepared a lot of material because I, I really don't know <coughs> your backgrounds. Your backgrounds are very different, I think, from uh, one another. So uh, it is likely that some of the topics that I put in my handouts that will be given to you after the lessons are too, too many. So I will have to skip some. But in case you get bored, which means that I'm telling you useless things or things that you already know, please tell me and I will uh, skip the, the topic, okay? So, uh, I work at the University of Milan in Italy and uh, in, in my past I did a lot of theoretical computer science, but in the last 10 years I have been working a lot on data mining. So this is my main, well, large data mining I would say. This is my main subject today. I also collaborate with, with Yahoo, the search engine, precisely on this, on this topic. And the first lesson <coughs> which, uh, with which I, I will start is link analysis. Um, now, uh, let me start by telling you what, what ranking is. Uh, so you, you are certainly familiar with search engines, but actually search engines are an example of a thing that existed even much before than search engines that are called information retrieval engines. And the idea is very simple. You have a lot of data, you have a collection of documents, those are your data, and you, you input a query in your system, and you want, as output, the set of documents that match your query. Sometimes the query language is very precise, like SQL, in case you know SQL, but most of the time the query language is not so precise and the structure of the documents is very uh, poor, like pure text documents. So mm, an example, a mo more modern example is Facebook. Now, in Facebook, there is uh, also this problem that is, how does Facebook choose the signals that are more relevant to you? Have you ever wondered about it? So when you enter your Facebook home, how many of you do have a Facebook account, by the way? All of you. So when you enter Facebook, you see some events that are related to your friends, but some you don't see. How does Facebook choose which events to show you? Have you ever wondered about it? Uh, pro well, of course, now, probably. But apart from promotion, how does it choose to show you what Irina did instead of what Svetlana did? So, actually, uh, this is a problem that is choosing which of your friends' signals are more relevant to you which is exactly like choosing the documents that are more relevant to a query. And it's not only a problem of, or another example, choosing which among your non-friends sh should be suggested. This may be a friend of yours. Hmm? So this is an example of selection and ranking. This is very important because there are two separate things. One is selecting which documents are relevant for a query. And another problem is, once you selected the documents that are relevant for a query, decide in which order to show them to you. The second part of the problem is called ranking. So the second part attains at establishing a score for every document that, is, that tells you how relevant the document is for the query. So formally, a scoring system is a function 
that for every document and every query returns a score that tells you how relevant the document is for the query. Is that everything clear? So, uh, keep in mind that order is very important. And I will tell you more about this later. But uh, actually, in a search engine or in Facebook or in every object of this kind, there are actually many ranking functions, many of these functions. And usually they are somehow aggregated. So uh, given a document and a query, you apply all the ranking functions you have, you get a number of scores, and then you aggregate them, for example, by a linear combination. So I will concentrate on a specific rank function, but keep in mind that usually in Google, on Yahoo, or Facebook, they use many ranking functions, and then they aggregate them. So uh, what happens when a search engine, but here I use the example of a search engine, but think of Facebook if you prefer it. What happens when a search engine receives a query? First of all, it selects among all the possible documents it has, the set of documents, SQ, that satisfy the query. For example, if you look for pizza mozzarella, you will choose, the search engine will choose only the documents that contain the words pizza and mozzarella, probably, or, or, the, or one of the two. And then, once this set is, has been selected, he will decide, he, the search engine, will decide how to rank S of Q. Now, this is most crucial for many reasons. Keep in mind that typically uh, a search engine user, a web user, inputs very short queries, like pizza mozzarella or a uh, uh, good movie. On the average, the, the typical query contains only three words. So not pizza mozzarella, but pizza mozzarella Italia, something like that. So the queries are very, very, very broad. By the way, you know what, what is the most popular query in Yahoo? This is an under non-disclosure, but I think I can tell you. What is the most popular, uh, can you guess? The most popular query in Yahoo? Well, Google. <laughs> okay, who said Google? Google is the second one. <laughs> <laughs> the most popular is the empty query. So the empty query is the first one, and the second one is Google. So. Typical queries are short, very short, which means that the results are many. And the, the user typically doesn't even look at the second page. If there are 10 pages, it will look only on the second page. Most users don't know that pages exist, actually. Some users can't scroll the screen, so they only see the first three answers. And most of them only click on the first. So you understand that ranking is very important. Ranking is extremely important. And in the past, the, the competition between search engines was based on freshness, usability, coverage. Coverage means how many of the pages are indexed. Freshness means how often a page is indexed. But nowadays, more or less, the three big search engines that are Yahoo, Google, and Bing, at least in Europe, because at least in Western Europe, because uh, in other areas of the world, there are other search engines that are very much more popular, actually. Uh, for example, in China, there is a, a search engine of their own that is used only there, but it's the first one in China. So but anyway, uh, in a search engine, nowadays, those elements are more or less the same. The freshness, the coverage, the usability is more or less the same for the three big search engines. The difference is ranking. So the reason why Google became popular and is still very popular is ranking. It's very good at ranking. Now, the ranking problem can be, uh, recall that a ranking function is a function like this, OK? Now, there, are a there is a special case that is a function, sigma, that does not depend on the query. So a function that assigns a value to documents independently of the query. These are very strange ranking functions that are called static. A static ranking function is a function that assigns a, a score to a page without, looking, without even looking at the query. 
trying to give a, a rank that is proportional to its importance, whatever importance means. And today I'm going to tell you about one special kind of stat static ranking that is called page rank. Uh, page rank not only is a static, which means that assign it assigns a score of importance to every page regardless of the query, but it's also only linkage based, which means that the ranking of importance does not de depend on the content of the page, but only on the link, on the link structure. And uh, the basic assumption behind page rank and behind all these ranking techniques that are based only on links is that a link is a way to confer importance. If you put uh, a URL in your ho own home page, it means that you actually are saying this page is important for me. So this is the basic idea. And notice that, in general, the term link analysis um, refers to the set of techniques that are used for, in particular for ranking, but also for other purposes, and that are based only on the link structures of documents. In, in this case, I'm thinking of documents that are hypertext, like the web. Everything is clear? You're following me, okay? So, uh, this is something that you probably know already, but let me briefly and quickly go uh, on this. So, you can think of the web as a graph, as a directed graph. Uh, the nodes of this graph are the URLs, and the arcs correspond to hyperlinks. So, there is an arc between, uh, from URL X to URL Y whenever the page denoted by URL X contains a hyperlink to the page denoted by URL Y. This is the web graph. This is what I call web graph. The web graph is a very big object. Uh, now, it's quite difficult to say how big it is, but uh, the, mo well, the most recent estimates say that it contains be behind uh, between 8 and 11 billions of nodes. This is excluding the dark mass. You know what the dark mass is? In the web, the dark mass is the part of the web that is not indexed by search engines. There is a big part of the web that is not indexed either because it's private, so it's accessible only via credentials, or because it's accessible only filling up a form. There are many web, web pages that are accessible only after you fill in a form. And of course, uh, search engines cannot fill in forms. Uh, by the way, many people say that the part of the web that is currently known to search engines is only about the 10 or 20% of the whole thing. So the 80, 90% of the web is dark. It's not indexed by search engines. Uh, on between these nodes, there are something like five, 100 billions of arcs, so it's a huge thing. And uh, about 600 millions of hosts, and used, I don't know how these figures came out, probably I completely invented them. But anyway, um, be very careful here, because when I say something about the web, I should al always say that our knowledge of the web is only very indirect. We, we know the web only because uh, search engines crawled the web. But some of the things we think of the web may be artifacts of the way the web is collected. So we are actually not sure. I mean, we speak of an object that we never saw, that we can only barely look at by crawlers. You know what a crawler is? Okay, so this is more or less the shape, the typical shape of the web. It's called the bow tie. So if you, if you take the web and you plot it as a graph, it looks more or less like that. So it has the, the central part, this part, is a big strongly connected component, which means that from every page, you can go to every other page by following some links. In, in this central, in this strongly connected component. And it contains about one third of the whole thing. 
This is called the, the core or, or the giant component of the web. On the left, so uh, on, this is the giant component. Its estimated diameter is between 20 and 30, which means that uh, the, two far, the two elements in the core that are farthest away are ab about 20 to 30 clicks away. Or if you look at it, forgetting about the directions of arcs, the diameter is smaller, it's between 10 and 17. On the left-hand side, you have all the pages from which you can reach the core, but to which you cannot get back. In a sense, those elements here are the parias of the web. For example, if you invent a new home page, suppose you, you decide to start a new home page, and in your home page you link some of your friends, then your home page will be here for some time. Until somebody, uh, until some famous guy decides to link you. As soon as some famous guy, or well, not famous, it, the only important thing is that his home page is here, decides to, to point you. As soon as it does, your page will fall in the core. So the, the elements that are here are newly born page, pages that are not pointed by from the core. On the right hand side, there are pages that you can reach from the core, but that cannot be from which you cannot get back. There are many examples of the, these pages. Can you tell me one, for example? So a page from which you cannot get back using links. Search pages? Search engine and output contain a lot of links. Actually, something more trivial. PDF pages with no links. Every document that doesn't contain a link is here, because from that document you cannot go anywhere. So actually, many, many documents are here. The, the doc files, PS files without links, or PDF files without links. So. The two elements here, from year and year, are, uh, contain about one third uh, of, of, the, of the net. And then there are those elements that are called, that are called tubes, tendrils, isolated components. Those elements, for example, there are tu the tubes are elements, are uh, like pages that, allows you to, that allow you to go from here to here without passing through the core. Or tendrils are those small things here. So this is the overall structure, shape of the web. Uh, I, I needed to, to tell you how the web is, uh, how the web topology looks like, because later you will see that it, is, it turns out to be very important to decide if a ranking is, sense, um, is meaningful or not. So let me get back to the ranking problem. Uh, in general, ranking means that you have a document and a query and you assign a score to the pair document query. And the, there are actually four categories of rankings. Well, here the first column is for the ranking techniques that depend on the query. Those are usually called the dynamic. And they are called dynamic because you compute them only after the user has input the query. So you have to wait for the query before computing the, the score, because the score depends on the query. Whereas those that does, do not depend on the query are called static, like the one I'm going to introduce now. And then uh, here there are two rows. One is whether, they, whether those techniques look at the content of the page or not. Uh, there are techniques that don't look at the content of the page. One of them is hits, and if I will have time at the end of this uh, class, I will tell you how hits works. But the, the main uh, character of this, uh, of this class is page rank. Page rank was introduced by Brin and Page, that are actually the founders of Google, in 1998. And it's well, many people say that it's the real uh, ingredient, secret ingredient, that made Google so popular at that time. And uh, it is popular because, first of all, it is static, so you can compute it beforehand. 
You, you have all the web pages collected by your own crawler. And first of all, even before st starting the, the search engine, you compute the importance of the pages. And you can, do, you can take whatever times, time you want, because once you have computed it, it's a, it's a score, it's a number that you attribute to every page. And after that, you can add all the other scoring functions you want. But the important, the important score is computed offline. And uh, actually, it can be computed quite efficiently. And it's the main, it used to be the main ranking technique used at Google. Probably now it's not anymore. Uh, but they still do. I mean, certainly a part of the ranking used at Google, we don't know because it's a secret, but probably a part of it is page rank. And even at Yahoo, I'm pretty sure they use page rank as well. So uh, let me introduce page rank with a metaphor. There are many ways you can explain page rank to a new buy, like new. Oh, okay, probably some of you no page rank already, but I'm assuming you are new buys. There are many ways to explain what page rank is. One typical way is using the so-called uh, web surfer metaphor that you can find even in the original uh, brilliant page uh, paper. I am actually using a different metaphor that I like more because I invented it and because I think it's more reasonable. So suppose that every page has an amount of money representing its importance. So you have all the web pages. You are the web pages, let's see. You are the web pages I collected. There are many hyperlinks called connecting you. And you have an amount of money that determines, that symbolizes your importance. At the beginning, you have the same amount of money. And then we play the following game. At every step, you give all the money you have to all your links. So if you link to three pages, you take your money and you give one third to every page. It's like saying, if I have one million of importance, I will give away all my importance to the pages I link to. And if I link to two K pages, I will give one kth of my money to the pages I link to. Notice that I give away all my money, but I also receive money from the pages that link to me, right? When does it happen that I receive a lot of money? Either because there are many pages pointing to me, or because there are few pages, but rich ones. OK? And the idea is very simple. Of course, when are you important? If many people think that you are important, or, or if few important people think that you are important. This is the idea. So this is the idea of page rank, quite, quite simply. There is a, a, a small problem with this solution. The small problem is the following. Suppose that two people form an oligopoly. They decide to point to each other without giving away money, which means that at every step, they just exchange their money. So suppose that it's me and him. So I point to him, he points to me, and nobody else. So it may be the case that some of you point either to me or to him, but we don't, po don't point to anybody. So at every step, we receive the money from the system because people point to us, but we don't give it away. We just exchange the money. So at the end, we will suck away all the money from the system, right? This is called an oligopoly. And we want to avoid this because clearly it's fake. It's not a real importance. It's just that we are sucking money away from the system. So to avoid this, we introduce something that is called taxation. So at every step, people cannot give away all of its money. They must pay taxes. They pay a fixed amount of tax to the state. And the state redistributes the money to everybody, which means that at every step, for example, I give away only the 90% of my money, Whereas the 10% of my money, I must give it to the state. So, for example, the two of us, we give away one-tenth of our money to the state, and the remaining 90% we exchange. But the 10% of the money received by the state will be equally redistributed to everybody. The introduction of taxation is important to avoid oligopolies. And uh, so this is, uh, formally, it goes like this. You have a fixed... Uh, fraction alpha less than one of money 
that is redistributed by a page to its neighbors, whereas one minus alpha, that is the, the, the amount of taxation, is paid to the state. And the state redistributes it either equally to everybody or according to some special distribution. For example, uh, if you have the, here I called it the Berlusconi distribution. Now, for, fortunately, we don't have Berlusconi any longer, but Berlusconi probably doesn't like to have the money that the state collected redistributed equally to everybody. He will decide to give more money to somebody and less money to the rest. This is, this is what we call the preference vector. So the preference vector is the way the, the money collected by the state in form of a taxation gets redistributed to the people. So there are two ingredients, right? One is the amount of taxation we pay, how, how much of our money we must give to the state, and another one is the way the state redistributes those monies. This is called the preference vector. There is another problem that is, what do uh, people that have no outlinks do about their money? So as I told you, the, the rule of the game is, I give a part of my money to the state and the rest to my out neighbors. What should I do if I don't have out neighbors? The rule is that if you don't have out neighbors, you give everything to the, money, to the state. Those nodes, the nodes that have no outgoing arcs, are called dangling nodes. The dangling nodes are treated in a special way. So let, let me uh, show how this works on a, on a small example. So here is the web graph. Here is an example of a web graph. And here is uh, the surfer, okay? I, I will tell you the same thing that I told you with the money using this, the classic metaphor this time. So uh, the classic metaphor is the following. You have a, a guy called the web surfer that sits in a, a node of the web. At every time, it can do two different things. One is choosing one of the out neighbors of the current node to go to. So for example, if he is at the blue node there, the blue node contains two links, one towards node number two and one towards node number four, he can decide to go to node number two or to node number four, and he will do so in a, um, in a uniform way. So with probability one half he will go here, with probability one half he will go here. Or another thing he can do is jumping to a random node in the, in the web. This is called teleportation or teleporting. So actually what he does is, first of all, I decide whether to move or to teleport. And I will teleport with probability one minus alpha. So with probability alpha, I decide to move to one of the out neighbors. And with probability one minus alpha, I will decide to teleport. If I decided to move, I will choose among the possible out neighbors to which out neighbor to move in a uniform way. If I decided to teleport, I will decide where to teleport in a uniform way. So the process, is the process clear? Actually, it's just another way to explain exactly the same metaphor. So for example, the guy here decided not to teleport and to move to node number four. Now again, he can choose whether to move to node number five, which is the only out neighbor, or to teleport. He decides to teleport. And among the possible target, he teleported to node number two. And then again, he can choose whether to move to one of the out neighbors, in this case, zero or three, or to teleport. Let's say he decides to move to node number three. Now, at this, this is a special case because, as you can see, he can only teleport because there are no out neighbors. So he will decide to teleport. He cannot do anything else. This is the special case I told you before. If you reach a node that has no out neighbors, you must teleport. Or, using the other metaphor, a node with no out links must pay everything to the, to the state. Uh, and the page rank is actually the amount of time the web surfer spends on, a sing on every single page, which uh, is a measure of importance of the page. Or if you use the other metaphor, you play the game and you look at how much money everybody has. This is a measure of its importance. Now, I tell you uh, exactly the same things, but using mathematics. So, 
sorry, am I supposed to break at some point? Oh, no. Okay, so I will go on. So let's try to define page rank formally. The formal definition I is uh, that the page rank is a limit distribution of a stochastic process. So I will define the stochastic process and I will show you that the stochastic process has a single limit distribution, a single uh, stationary distribution. And notice that this distribution depends on many different things. First of all, it depends on the graph, of course. Second, it depends on the preference vector. The preference vector, remember, is the way the taxes collected by the state are redistributed among the people. It can be uni the uniform vector or it can be something else. Another thing that I didn't mention but it's important is the way we decide to patch the dangling nodes. Uh, in the previous slide, I, I have assumed that the dangling nodes are patched by imagining that they point to everybody. So actually what we do is taking the graph and before starting the page rank process, we add fake links from every dangling node to everybody else, which is equivalent to assuming that dangling nodes must pay everything to the state. Or we can decide that the dangling nodes are special and that they redistribute the part of the money that they own in a special way. I mean, the process is always the same, right? Uh, can I write there? If I, if I write, you can read? Mm. Okay, it depends on how I write. So, the process is always the same. With probability alpha, I do something. With probability one minus alpha, I do something else. So with probability one minus alpha, or if you prefer, a fraction one minus alpha of my money goes to the state. And then the state redistributes it according to V, the preference vector. Another part of my money, a fraction alpha of my money, goes to my out neighbors. The problem is, if I don't have out neighbors, what should I do? So if I'm a dangling node, what should I do? Well, in this case, I cannot give it to my out neighbors. I redistribute it according to a distribution U. So dangling nodes are special in the sense that since they cannot give away their money, they, they give the fraction of their money that they own and that are not paid as taxes to everybody according to a special distribution. This is called the dangling node distribution. And it may be different from this one. Is the process clear? Okay, so a part of my money is not mine. It directly goes to the state. The part that is really mine either is given to the out neighbors, if I have some, or if I don't have some, it's redistributed. And here you, you see all the ingredients. The ingredients are alpha, the amount of my money that I can give away, or if you prefer, one minus alpha, that is the amount of taxation, V, that is the preference vector, and U, that is the dangling node distribution. And of course, here is not written, but it's clearly important, the graph G. So, Alpha, by the way, is usually called a damping factor. And uh, remember that alpha must be smaller than one. Because if alpha is one, it means that I don't, there are no taxes. And if there are no taxes, uh, there is the risk of forming oligopolies. Uh, one nice thing is that we will uh, develop a machinery, a mathematical machinery to treat with the case alpha is uh, smaller than one, and then we will try to see what happens when alpha goes to the limit. So when alpha reaches one. It, it will be interesting to look at it. So let me give a formal definition of page rank. Let me start by this. So let me call by G the graph, uh, or equivalently, its uh, adjacency matrix. Remember that the graph is directed, so G is not symmetric. Uh, 
And let me call G bar the row normalized version of G. So you take every row that is non-zero and you divide every element by the number of ones. So that every row is either zero or a row that now sums to one. This is called G bar. You get it? Okay. So G bar is something like, let's say. If, the, if G was uh, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, uh, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and, uh, uh, and let's say 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, then, okay, the rows that are zeros, these are the dangling nodes, and we don't touch them. The rows that are non-zero, we divide them so that they sum up to one. So the first row contains three ones. The third row contains four ones. And the last row contains two ones. So this is G bar. G bar is the same as G, but you make it sub-stochastic, sub-row stochastic. Sub-row stochastic means that apart from the rows that are zeros, it's row stochastic. So this is G bar. And uh, let me write D for the characteristic vector of dangling nodes. So in, the, in this case, D is going to be like zero uh, one zero one one zero. It's the characteristic row uh, vector of, of dangling nodes. Then what we do is the following. This is the definition of page rank. So pa the page rank vector is the only solution of this equation, the only solution R of this equation. Let me go enter into this equation piece by piece so that you can appreciate what it means. Uh, okay. So first of all, what's this? G bar plus DTU. You tell me. G bar is over there. U, remember, is the dangling node distribution. What does G bar plus DTU mean? How should I modify this? Okay, I replace every zero row with a vector U, and I leave all the other rows untouched. Okay, so what I do is I take the three rows here and I substitute them with a U. Notice that now, by doing this, I obtained a, a, a matrix that is stochastic. It's not, it's row stochastic. Every row is a distribution now. Before it wasn't. So I call this part P to remember that it's a stochastic uh, matrix. And now what I do, you can see it very clearly, I, do a, I take a convex combination of P and something else. So I take alpha of P plus minus 1 minus alpha times something else. What I do is taking a, a convex combination between P and another matrix. The other matrix is here, 1 TV. What is 1 TV, you tell me? It's not exactly the identity matrix. Okay, it's a matrix where whose all rows equal to V. So it's V, 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 V. It's many copies of V. It's a rank one matrix. And uh, what I mean is that I take this matrix here and I combine it with another very simple matrix that is V, 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 V. And I use alpha and one minus alpha as, as uh, the two coefficients. So I call all this part here, M. And uh, what I am looking for is a vector R such that Rm is equal to R. That's it. First of all, I should uh, wonder whether there exists one and whether there exists exactly one. Now, if you know something about uh, theory of the theory of stochastic networks, 
of, uh, of Markov chains, actually, um, you can see that there is exactly one solution, if and only if M is, ergotic, uh, is an ergodic matrix. And actually, it is easy to see that if, if alpha is smaller than one, M is an ergodic matrix. So there is exactly one norm one solution to that equation. But only if alpha is smaller than one. If alpha is larger than, if, sorry, if alpha is equal to one, then M is, needs not be ergodic. And in particular, it, it will not be ergodic if the graph is not strongly connected. So the, actually, if you want, the theoretical reason behind taking alpha smaller than one is that if alpha is equal to one, the matrix is not ergodic. So that there is more than one solution. The practical reason is the formation of oligopolis. And you can see the two things. Actually, they are the same thing. Ergodic is uh, the mathematical way to say we don't want oligopolies. You following me? Okay, so this is page rank. Now, the problem is we have M, but how do we find R? There are two, th two ways, of course. If you, if you look at it, it's just a linear system. We are going to solve a linear system. And uh, Actually, it can be solved as a linear system. Now, let me rewrite uh, the, the equations. So, the starting equation was this one, which is more explicitly this one, or this one. Or if you take this and put it on the second, uh, uh, on the right-hand side, you get this one. Which means that you actually have a very nice and closed formula for page rank. This closed formula is Identity minus alpha p. Remember that alpha p is this matrix here. Okay. So, uh, sorry, p is this matrix here. Alpha p is alpha times this. You take identity minus alpha p. This turns out to be non singular, so you can invert it. You multiply it by v, the preference vector, and you multiply by y minus alpha, and you get the. Per the you get page rank. Uh, of course, you cannot really invert the matrix, but you can. For example, either use gauss seidel to, to solve this system. So this is a linear system, and you solve it via some linear system solution, like gauss seidel or Jacobi or whatever you like. Or you can use the power iteration method. That is, you, you start from any distribution, and you start multiplying it by m. For the general theory of Markov chains, if you have an ergodic Markov chain M, you can get the limit distribution by taking any, distribu any starting distribution and multiplying it by M. M, M, M. It will stabilize to the solution you want. Actually, in practice, this is the method that is used more, more often because it's very easy to implement. You start with any distribution, you multiply it by M, you have M. M is this. Well, it's a convex combination of this and something else. But. So easy. Notice that I'm not going to tell you about how page rank is computed. This is, a, uh, this is actually a big uh, realm. Okay, there are many people that worked on this subject. How to compute page rank efficiently. You have a graph and you want to compute page rank efficiently. This is something that uh, I did. Actually, I'm not an, a big expert, but uh, I, I worked on this subject. Uh, and I'm not going to tell you anything about it. So, but this, this is a very re big research area. So how to compute or to approximate page rank uh, in, a, in an efficient way. Notice that this solution here is only approximated, because for every k you get better and better approximation, you get closer and closer to the solution, but you, you will never have the solution. Whereas in theory, you can have the solution, because if you invert the matrix here, you will get a big and precise solution of the, of the problem. And today, I'm going to deal with the precision with a precise version. So I forget about how hard it is to compute page rank, and I concentrate on page rank itself, so on the, on the real thing, on, on this equation. Any questions? OK, I can go on. So there is another, yet another way to look at this. Uh, remember this, because uh, we will continuously have to deal with this equation. So this is page rank. Y minus alpha times the preference vector times I 
identity minus alpha p to the minus one. Now, if you only concentrate on this, you probably know that this is equivalent to this. Did you know that? Okay, it's, it's exactly like, uh, like with numbers. Summation from zero to infinity to of beta to the k is equal to one over one minus beta. Exact, exactly the same with, with the matrices. So if you look at page rank in this way, there is something nice here because uh, you see that there is this summation, meaning that uh, there is something going on here regarding um, paths. And actually, this is a nice way to think of page rank. Uh, let me directly go to the, to the equation. So you can prove that the page rank of page i can be obtained apart for this mm, multi mm, multiplying factor as a summation. And let's look together at this summation. So it's a summation that ex ranges for every path that enters into i. So you look at node i and look at all the paths that go to i. There are many. Usually there are infinitely many such paths. Now, every path gives a contribution to the rank of node i. And you, the contribution is made by three parts. First of all, the part here is the preference vector at the starting node. So suppose that there is a path going from me to him. Now, my importance is part of the, of the contribution. So the contribution of the path that goes from me to him is my importance multiplied by this factor that is a factor that decays exponentially with the length of the path. So if you have a path of length 7, it will be multiplied by alpha to the 7. If the path has length 20, it will be multiplied by alpha to the 20. So it's a decay factor that makes the, uh, the importance go smoother and smoother. And then there is the, this other factor here that is called the branching contribution. The branching contribution is the product of the degrees of the nodes that I find on my path. So think, think of it in the following way. I start with my own importance, and there is this path that goes to him. Now, along this path, I find many nodes, and those nodes have a branching factor. They have a different degree. If they have a large degree, they will... Uh, lose a lot of, uh, a big part of, of my importance will get lost. If they have a small degree, my importance will not get lost. But it will decay anyway exponentially at every step until reaching him. So it will be small because of two different things. One is the length of the path, and another one is the number of branches that I find along the path. I show you uh, here on, on a picture, probably it's clearer. So I have a node here, and then there is this path that goes to this target node T. So I have a source node S and a target node T. And among the many paths that enter in T, okay, T has many paths entering in it. Among the many paths, I look at, I concentrate on this. Now let's look at this. Suppose that this node has a degree three, this node has degree, let's say, one, two, three, four, five, and this node has degree one. Now, the branching contribution is one third times one fifth times one, which means that, uh, sorry, I have to also to take into account this. So if this has degree two, one half, which means that only one half times one third times one fifth times one of my initial importance arrives here. This is because when a, a node has many outgoing arcs, much of my importance will get lost. And then there is a second attenuating factor that depends on the length. In this case, the length is one, two, three, four. So it gets multiplied by alpha to the four. Okay? So these are the two, the, there are two attenuating factors. One depends on the, on the length of the path, and one depends on the branching of the path. 
Is that clear? Now, actually, notice that this guy here, we receive many contributions, one for every path. So this is just a contribution for a single path. The nice thing about it is that this attenuating factor can be generalized. Uh, we thought about it some time ago, and uh, we defined what we call a generalized page rank. There is a page rank where the attenuating factor, depending on alpha, can be plugged. So you can de decide that the attenuation is not exponential, as in page rank, but it's linear, for example, or it's something else, or it's something that goes exponential for some time and then goes to zero. And we, we played with it, and there are many interesting variants of this. I, I will tell you something more about it in a, in a while. This is a generalization of page rank that changes the, the way the damping attenuates the, the importance decay. Now, um, let me rewrite uh, the page rank equation in the following way. So you, you should remember the original equation. Let me get back to it. So I'm starting from this one. Now, if you rewrite it appropriately, you get this one. And this is nice because it shows that R is actually a, a series. Which this actually shows R as a Maclaurin series around alpha. And uh, because as you can see, R here, imagine that alpha is not fixed. Imagine that it's only a symbol. So you can see that R is a function of alpha, and this expression here gives directly the um, um, coefficients of alpha to the one, alpha to the second, and so on. So it's, uh, it's the, Maclaurin uh, the Maclaurin series of R as a function of alpha. And you can actually truncate it after a while, obtaining a, a truncated Maclaurin polynomial. This is a nice result we got some time ago. So uh, what we got is actually that if you, uh, v, to the, uh, v times m to the n, which is the nth uh, iteration approximation of page rank using the powers uh, method, is actually equal to the Maclaurin to the nth degree Maclaurin polynomial of page rank. So actually, the, um, the power method computation corresponds to something very precise from a mathematical viewpoint. The nth step uh, power method computation exactly corresponds to the nth degree of Maclaurin polynomial approximated page rank. But be careful here, you must use V as starting uh, vector. Because for the power method here, you can use anything. Actually, for this theorem to be true, you must start with v, the preference vector. If you start with the preference vector, after n iterations, you get exactly the nth degree truncation of, uh, of page rank as a Maclaurin uh, polynomial uh, of alpha. Now, actually, this fact allows you, if you want, to compute explicitly the coefficients of the Taylor, of the Maclaurin uh, series. Because you can take the, you, you do the power method iteration, OK? And at every step, you compute the difference between the kth vector and the k minus, minus one vector. This difference divided by alpha to the k is exactly the kth coefficient of the power series. You may say, but it's not a number, it's a vector. Yes, it's a vector because this power series is a vector power series. There is a page rank function at every node. But it's exactly the, the kth coefficient of the power series. And using this technique, you can save those coefficients on the disk and uh, get them back to recompute page rank on another alpha. This is nice because you computed page rank for a given value of alpha. Let's say alpha equal to 0.5. While doing this, you save the, the coefficients of the series on disk. And then you can reuse the coefficients of the series to evaluate page rank on another value of alpha. Let's say alpha equals 0 0.7, without recomputing it, because you have the, you have the coefficients. So actually, this is a, a very nice technique 
well, I shouldn't say nice because I, we invented it, but it's a, it's a technique to compute page rank on any alpha, just computing it on a single alpha. You compute it on a single alpha, and then you reuse the coefficients you got on, along the way to reevaluate it on any, on any alpha you want. And okay, so uh, actually, this is even more is true because once you have the series, actually it's not the series, but it's the first terms of a series, you can even evaluate the derivatives of page rank. Because once you have a series, you can get the series of the derivative. Of course, the approximation gets worse and worse, because if you start from an n truncated series uh, of page rank, you get an n minus 1 truncated series of the first order derivative and an n minus 2 Mm, uh, truncated uh, the, mm, series for the second order derivatives and so on, but still it's something. And uh, these are some typical behaviors. So uh, until now, I just told you something vague. This is actually uh, done on, a, on an actual network. So I took a network, I ran the page rank polynomial, uh, sorry, I ran the page rank algorithm, saving at every iteration, the, the coefficients of the series, and then I use them to reevaluate page rank on every alpha, actually on, on a number of alphas, and I did it for, every, for some nodes. So these are four nodes of the, of the network, and what you see here is their page rank value uh, is the way their page rank values changes when alpha ranges from 0 to 1. Let me go to, to directly to uh, an explicit case. The same thing, but explicitly. So I, here I took the very same uh, example as before. So this is the graph. And I did the actual symbolic computation of page rank. So I did the 1 minus alpha times v times identity minus alpha p to the minus 1. But I did it symbolically in alpha. And I plotted the page rank of all the nodes as it changes from 0 to 1. For example, this is the page rank of node number 0. It's, I computed it with maple, not manually. <laughs> this is the page rank of node number 0. And you can see it here. Note how page rank changes when, zero, when uh, alpha goes from 0 to 1. Let, let us stop for a moment to think if it makes sense to us. Let's consider the case 0. So the case 0 corresponds to, remember that 1 minus alpha is the amount of taxation. So alpha equals 0 corresponds to what, which situation? Give everything to the state. So alpha equals to 0 means taxation 100%. It means that the graph doesn't count nothing and all the money gets redistributed to everybody equally. Here in this example, I'm considering that the preference vector is the uniform vector. And as you can see, when alpha is equal to zero, every node has this exactly the same page rank, that is one-tenth, because there are 10 nodes. They, are all, they all have the same page rank. Now, let's look at what happens in the limit here, when alpha goes to one. Remember that alpha goes to 1 is a, is a dangerous case because it allows the formation of oligopolies. Actually, what happens is that almost all nodes have page rank equal to 0, except two guys. Which ones? 4 and 5. 4 and 5 are the only ones that at the end will have page rank equal to 0 0.5 because they suck away all the money from the system. Okay? So the, the two limit cases are very, are very clear here. No? They, are, they correspond exactly to what we were thinking of. And you see that actually every single uh, function here is a rational function of alpha. Uh, it's obvious. It's, uh, they are obtained as a rational function of alpha. So they are rational functions of alpha with no poles, which means that they have a limit uh, for alpha equal to 1. In the case alpha equal to 1 is cannot be defined directly because you cannot invert the matrix i minus alpha p, but you can define it indirectly as a limit because those functions have a limit for alpha go that goes to 1. Notice also that depending on alpha, there are situations in which, for example, the node 0 is more important than the other nodes for many values of alpha, but starting from here, it becomes less and less important. And at the end, it will, goes, it will go away like everybody else except for 4 and 5. 
So actually, the importance of the node depends pretty much on the value of alpha. And the choice of the value of alpha is uh, very subtle. When Brin and Page described the process, they said we took alpha equal to 0 0.85. It works very well. That's it. And actually, this is the value that everybody uses, 0 0.85. But why? I mean, 0 0.85 mm, is like here. I don't know. For, for, uh, according to your opinion, which node is more important here? Zero appears very important, right? Because it has all these friends. Actually, uh, even these friends of zero can be quite in as important as zero, I would say. Not, not as important as zero, but almost. Uh, so actually, we, we don't want to choose alpha too big, right? Because when alpha is too big, four and five seem more important than zero. It doesn't make much sense. We will uh, now get back to this, to this issue. So uh, here I show R1 of, of alpha and, and so on. By the way, I, I don't know if uh, the organizers already gave you the assignments that I decided uh, to give you. Now, I, I came out with some exercises that you can do either here or at home when you get back at home. And one of the assignments is precisely to uh, use Maple or Mathematica or whatever you like to do exactly this job. So I give as input a graph and I want to know exactly the rational function corresponding to the page rank of every node. This is one of the assignments. There are uh, some. So for every, actually, for every lesson there is a corresponding assignment. Uh, I think that the organizers will give uh, the PDF to you soon probably after this, this class. And if you have, pre please read them. And if you have questions, don't hesitate to ask me. Any, any question now? OK. So let me get back to the problem of choosing alpha. Why alpha equal dot 85 is good? Because the smart guys at Google use it. <laughs> or because it works pretty well, as they say. Um, Actually, there is a, um, a computational reason. When alpha goes bigger and bigger, it goes closer and closer to 1, the computation becomes harder and harder in the sense that the, all the method, all the approximation method, tend to converge slow, uh, more and more slowly. So taking alpha equal dot 85 is good because if you take larger values, the computation will become more difficult, and actually numerically unstable. So there are some computational reasons to, to use alpha not too big. I, we think, I think, that understanding how page rank changes when alpha is modified is important because it tells you a big deal about the structure of the network, about the nature of the node, and uh, about many other things. Now, um, Actually, the, there, are, there is a lot of literature about it. Uh, many people try to, to show that page rank modify, uh, changes and changes a lot when alpha is modified. Actually, Pretto, who is, an another, Itali who is another, another Italian, uh, did a lot of works that more or less have the following flavor. I want to show you how strange page rank is by presenting you a, a, um, a network where the importance changes in every possible way by changing alpha. So, for example, he shows that there are networks where, every, where each of the n factorial possible orderings of the nodes appears depending on alpha. Of course, they are very contrived, but... So, it's, it's a nice... If you, if you like playing with, uh, with graphs and mathematics, it's nice to see those examples. Um, there are people that... Uh, looked at the convergence rate of the power method uh, and showed that the convergence rate is alpha. Uh, this is an interesting uh, paper where they show that the condition number is this here. This also shows that when alpha goes to 1, the condition number goes to infinity, which explains why uh, the problem becomes so unstable when alpha gets very close to 1. Um, there are people that actually uh, came out with nice ways to compute uh, page rank when alpha is close to 1. 
they use Arnoldi type methods. Actually, there are people that, uh, there are some numerical analysts that like to, to see what happens if alpha is not a real number, but it's an imaginary number. There are strange things happening there. Of course, it doesn't make any practical sense, but it's nice. And uh, in particular, Sera Capizzano and uh, Brzezinski and Redivo Zaglia have a paper that show what happens in general when alpha is whatever. It is a, quat is a quaternion or is a complex number. Um, there, is, there is a group of guys that have good reasons to uh, suggest that the, good, the best possible value is alpha equals one half. They, they show that with alpha equal one half, good things happen. So it may be good to use alpha equal 0 0.5, even if nobody does. But anyway, uh, the, the, the point that many people get convinced on is, anyway, when alpha is very close to one, the page rank value are better. The reason behind this naive thinking is, if alpha is very close to 1, we are looking more and more at the graph structure. So as alpha goes to 1, which means there, are no, no, not much there is no, not much taxation, the world is more free. It's a sort of a liberalism, right? They, they look at, at a perfect world where there are almost no taxation because they say it works better. Actually, I will prove that it's not true. It's not true. So when alpha goes to one, page rank becomes meaning, meaning, meaningless. And uh, already in the example I showed you, it was clear. When alpha goes to one, the situation becomes unbearable. And there is a precise reason behind it. So the general theme is studying page rank when alpha goes to one. And um, ap apparently it becomes a more faithful uh, image of what is going on, but actually it's not, it's not. And um, so first of all, I want to skip this very rapidly. There is a way to obtain an explicit uh, formula for the case when alpha goes to one, and it turns out to be related to the Cesaro limit of the matrix P. You will read this in the slides, that will be given to you. I'm not going to enter into the, this detail now because I should, okay. So I still have half an hour, but this is quite boring, so I will skip it. So actually what, what happens, uh, I don't want to enter into the details of these equations, but I want to enter into, into the core of the problem. The core of the problem is the following. So, Think of the matrix M as a function of alpha. So when, uh, let us assume for the moment that U and V are the uniform vectors. So what is M when alpha is equal to zero? It's the uniform matrix. So it's, of course, um, a stochastic matrix, it's of course um, ergodic, it's of course an, an ergodic matrix, but it doesn't make much sense. When alpha increases, and you, you go to one quarter, one half, and so on, M remains an ergodic matrix, so it has exactly one limit distribution. When alpha approaches to one, it remains an ergodic distribution, but, but gets less and less ergodic because it approaches a matrix that is um, here that is not ergodic, which means that here the eigenspace con uh, contains many solutions. And actually what happens is that your solution that is unique for all the time, has been unique for all the times, it will approximate one of the possible eigenvectors of the limit uh, matrix, but which one? Because the limit matrix has many eigenvectors. So why are we getting closer and closer to precisely one? Uh, this is something that amazed me because it's like saying there is a special one here. 
that is the only one that is approached to by this solution. And actually, it turns out to be related to the Cesaro limit. This is the explanation. So why there is one special eigenvector of the limit solution? It's special because it, it is obtained uh, as a Cesaro limit. And actually, what we would like to see is in which sense this solution is so special and different from the other ones. Actually, it turns out that you can characterize quite precisely uh, the characteristic, the features of this limit solution. So here, R star is the page rank when alpha goes to 1. So it's the limit of, of the page rank vector when alpha goes to 1. This limit is well defined because every component of the page rank vector is a rational function with no singular points around 1. So R star is well defined. Uh, now, mm, let me call a node of a graph a bucket if it is contained in a non-trivial, strongly connected component with no arcs to ar toward other components. So, just to be sure that you are on the same page. Take the graph. So you, you start with a graph, okay? Blah, 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 blah. And you divide the graph into strongly connected components. You know what a strongly connected component is, right? So you, you divide the graph into strongly connected components. Uh, th this is not a nice example, so let me redesign it, forgetting about the original graph. So you have the strongly connected components, and of course you have some arcs connecting them. Remember that strongly connected components form a uh, directed acyclic graph. There are no cycles here. Uh, the, non, the buckets are these elements here, provided that they are non-trivial. So they are, they are the terminal nodes in this DAG, provided that they are non-trivial. Non-trivial, it means that they must contain at, at least one arc, because there is a structure here, of course. No? It's a strongly connected component. So I am forgetting the, co the component that just contain one single node. Those are not buckets. The buckets are only these ones. What I will show, uh, actually it's the content of the next, next theorem, is that R star is zero everywhere except here. So R star is zero everywhere except in the buckets. And of course, this means, this has a, an, an important consequence. It means that page rank in the limit doesn't count a thing because most important nodes are here. They are not here. Actually, this is the content of, of, the, of the theorem that I'm not going to prove, but this is a characterization theorem. Uh, this uh, assumes that the uh, dangling node distribution is the uniform one, but you can uh, actually, the the whole statement is a little bit more complex. Actually, probably it's given here. Yes. So if you assume that the um, dangling node distribution is the uniform one, then if G contains a bucket, then a node is recurrent in the limit, even only if it is a bucket, which is exactly what I told you before, which means it is that uh, R star is zero everywhere except possibly on the bucket. There is a special case that if if G does not contain a bucket, because it's, po it's perfectly possible that for some graph there are no buckets. Well, in this case, every node is recurrent. But uh, uh, this is not a realistic case, because real-world graphs do contain at least one bucket. Actually, they contain a lot of buckets. This is the full theorem. The full theorem is for, uh, even for the case where the dangling node distribution is not the uniform one. Uh, it's a little bit more tricky because you need to, to think about the support of you, but I don't want to enter into these details. Um, and it is nice because if you th now think back to the bow tie, this is the bow tie, you remember? Now, the previous theorem says that when alpha goes to one, the only nodes that have non-zero page rank are those that appear here at the very right-hand side. Only the documents become non-zero. And it is clear to me that this kind of ranking doesn't make any sense.
because all important pages are here. All important pages are here, and they will have page rank zero. This is not what you want. So this is, to me, this is a formal proof that page rank, when alpha goes to one, doesn't make any sense, or if you prefer, that a world without taxation doesn't work. Taxation is needed, and alpha less than one is needed to make the world work. Uh, actually, there are many people, uh, in particular numerical analysts, that don't get, get convinced about it. And they continue publishing papers about how to compute page rank when alpha is very, very close to one. Well, you will be able to do but it doesn't make much sense anyway. Uh, so, let me briefly skip this. Okay, uh, this is an example actually, I think. Yes, the, it is the example, uh, the same example as before. So, you remember that we noticed uh, how page rank goes to zero everywhere except for nodes number four and five. Now, um, I must go quite quickly now. So, the, the, mm, there is an explicit way to, to look at the general behavior of page rank, in particular to compute the derivative of page rank with respect to alpha, but I'm going to jump it quickly. And, uh, well, this is something that uh, came to my mind some time ago. So, actually, since choosing alpha is so difficult, why don't we take the integral? This is uh, something you can do. So instead of, of looking at uh, the values at a specific va uh, value of alpha, take the integral and look at which uh, node has, as has the largest integral. So in, in this example here, uh, instead of choosing a specific alpha, you look at the, at the area behind each curve. Probably zero will win. This is something that I decided to call total rank. And actually, it's nice because total rank turns out to be a special case of the generalized page rank. You remember, the generalized page rank is page rank where alpha, where the decay, instead of being exponential in alpha, is something else, is a function. And actually, the total page rank can be uh, shown to be exactly a generalized page rank where the, where the decay is this one. So the decay function is the function that tells you for a path of length t uh, how to decay. So in this example, the function was t goes to uh, alpha to the t. And uh, with the total page rank is t goes to 1 over t plus 1, t plus 2 simply two different functions. Uh, there is this, that factor 1 minus alpha doesn't count a lot, but it's because of the exact way things are defined. Uh, the nice thing, okay, so total rank and page rank are two instances of this generalized page rank idea. And there is something nice here, because uh, we started to play, me and, uh, and Carlos Castillo, that is a researcher at Yahoo, actually now he's, he's in Qatar, but he used to work for Yahoo for a long time. And we started to, to look at these two formulas and we noticed this, the following. So, let us consider these two, these two formulas and in particular sum them up uh, sorry, uh, you, you take, so you have, sorry, you have Look, look at look comparatively at total rank and page rank. Each of them can be defined using the path formula, and the path formula contains a different factor. One is exponentially decaying, and one is decaying in another way. So uh, look at their difference up to a certain length, and try to find the alpha that minimizes the difference. So that minimizes the difference between page rank and total rank up to a certain path length. If you do that, you obtain this formula here. So this formula gives you the value of alpha that minimizes the difference, the sum of the differences, between the page rank contribution and the total rank contribution. 
As you can see, it depends on the length uh, up to which you have looked at the difference. And it turns out that if you plug in this formula, the average length of a path in a real world graph, you obtain dot 85. So apparently, this is a, a sort of a justification of dot 85. Dot 85 seems to be the best value of alpha that gives the, less, the least difference between total rank and page rank. So this is, well, this is just a suggestion. But it is, we never wrote this in any paper, but this is a suggestion that probably choosing dot 85 has something behind it. And, and uh, probably the reason is that there is a true ranking somewhere that we never discovered. And page rank approximates well this true ranking when alpha goes to dot 85. And total rank seems to be closer to this true ranking than, than page rank, in a sense. Now, uh, in the mm, little time uh, that uh, remains, uh, I want to tell you two, two more things. One is about the difference between strong and weakly preferential page rank that I will treat now. And then if I have some time, I want to tell you about another link analysis technique that is called HITS. So let me restart with the usual formula. So this is the good old formula for page rank. And you can see all the ingredients very clearly here, the, the preference distribution V, the dangling node distribution U, and of course the graph G. Now, uh, Everybody knows about pre the preference vector. So in every paper about page rank, you will see the word preference vector. But actually, few people think of this, of you. And uh, we started focusing on this. Uh, in particular, uh, in the literature, usually people don't think of you for two reasons. Either they consider always consider u equal to v. So they fix v and they also fix u or they assume that u is the uniform vector. So they only play with the preference vector and never look at, at u. But actually, we prefer to, to look at the thing in a general case. And actually, we introduced the, this nomenclature we call strongly preferential page rank, the case in which u equals to v, which means that you use this exactly the same distribution to patch dangling nodes and to redistribute the money. And we call weekly preferential page rank the case in which V and U are completely disconnected. So you, you have two, two different factors. And um, actually, you can show, it's not difficult, that there is almost no relation between the two. So if you, think, uh, if you consider strongly preferential page rank or weekly preferential page rank, for example, with U, the uniform uh, distribution, the relation between the two, the two resulting page rank vectors is absolutely almost nothing. The Kendall's tau is about dot 25. You know what Kendall's tau is? No. So Kendall's tau is a way to compare two rankings. Uh, suppose that, OK. Suppose that there are two, two men here, let's say me and him. Paolo, and what's your name? Your name is Pavel. Ah, Pavel. No, another <laughs> name. Constantine. So, Pavel and Constantine decided to rank all the girls in this room. <laughs> so, we have the girls number one, two, three, four, five. And we decide to rank them which means that we put them on a line. And I, I decide that for me, the more handsome girl is number three, and then number two, and then number four, and then number five, and then number one. And Constantine decides that, OK, girl number three is very nice. And then one, and then two, and then five, and then four. And now we have to decide how much we do agree or disagree. There are many ways to do that. One way is Kendall's Tau. And Kendall's Tau works like this. We consider all the possible pairs of girls. Let's say we start with one and three. And see if on this specific pair we agree or disagree. So for example, on one and three, we agree. Because we both think that three is more handsome than one. 
So we say we are concordant on this pair, and we count one. Then we consider another, another pair of girls. Let's say, let's say one and two. Now, on one and two, we disagree, because I think that two is more handsome than one. He thinks that one is more handsome than two. So we count a discordant, minus one. We do this for every pair, and we sum. And we divide, it by, the number, we divide by the number of pairs. The resulting number is called the Kendall's tau, and it, it is something between minus one and one. If it's one, it means that we agree on every pair, so that we actually produce this exactly the same order. If the result is minus one, it means that we disagree on every pair. So it means that his ordering is exactly the opposite of mine. So in this case, it would be one, five, four, two, three. Zero means that essentially that there is no relation. So the value is something between minus one and one, Positive values means that we more or less agree. Negative values means that we more or less disagree. Close to zero means that we more or less not disagree, but uh, have completely uncomparable opinions. And a value of dot 25 means that the two rankings are essentially unrelated. Dot 25 is really very small. It's very close to zero. So what we did here is we took uh, a web graph. In this case, it was a, a piece of the English web graph of UK. And we computed, we, we fixed uh, a, a certain preference vector, V. And then we did two different things. Once we computed the page rank assuming V equal to U, which means strongly preferential page rank. And the second time, we fixed U to the uniform distribution and left P V as before. We computed the two ranks and we compared them. The result was Kendall-Stout dot 25, which means that it is really important to decide beforehand whether you want to compute a strongly preferential or weakly preferential page rank because the two resulting rankings have almost no relation. Are you with me? You following me? Yes. A good, a good point. So he, he's saying that Kendall's Tau actually looks at the whole ranking, but what we care of is only the top. Because actually the top corresponds to the top results in Google, and this is what, what we really want to, to compare. The problem is that you can do that only after looking at the query. Because after looking at the query, so you have all the pages of the UK web, then you look at the query, which selects some of them, and you, you look at the top, right? But if you try to do that without looking at the query, it's very difficult to say what is the top, because the top will depend on the query. If you input a query like, uh, uh, I don't know, St. Petersburg, there will be only a few pages that probably, overall, they are not on the top. They are let's say, very low in the order. So the problem of the top K comparison, this is something that is discussed a lot in the literature, because of course it's important. The problem is that either you know beforehand how the pages will, will be selected before doing the ranking, or trying to compare the top ones doesn't make much sense because the top ones, what are the top pages in UK? Probably they are Google UK and I don't know, Telecom UK, but these are important only in an abstract sense, but if you look at a real query, they will not appear. You following me? Okay, so, but this is important anyway. Comparison should take into account more the top than the bottom of the ranking. There are versions of a Kendall's Tau that try to do that job. So that count di differently agreement and disagreement depending on whether the agreements and disagreements appear in the top of the ranking or in the bottom. But you must be careful there because in that case it, it means you can do that only if, he, if you are looking at the result of a query, not on the overall ranking. Now, uh, if you look at the weekly preferential case, weekly preferential means that V and U are not correlated, and you choose U, and then you choose V. Now, suppose that you fix U, however you please, and look at page rank only as a function of V. If you look at page rank only as a function of V, it is clearly a linear function, right? 
It's a linear operator applied to V. So uh, this is nice because you can compute directly the page rank on any convex combination because it's linear. So if you want to know the page rank of the combination of two preference vectors, you just compute the two different page ranks and compute them uh, and uh, um, put them together linearly. With the strongly preferential page ranks, things become more complicated. So if V and U must be the same, because if, if in this formula here, you assume that V and U are the same, then page rank is not anymore a linear function of V. Right? So with strongly preferential page rank, things become more tricky. But you can still work. And actually, the, the best way to go, in my opinion, is to define what we call the pseudo rank. The pseudo rank is like page rank. You see the formula. There is a small difference, small but important difference. You get the difference from here? I didn't use P, but I used G bar, right? Which means that. I, uh, the, the, the matrix you see here is not, is not stochastic. This matrix here is not stochastic. Uh, but still, you can invert it. And what you get is what we call a pseudo rank. And you get page rank as, an, as a combination of V and U. And the nice thing is that if you consider the strongly preferential uh, case, which is V equals to U, blah, blah, you get this formula here. And uh, what you see is that page rank is the pseudo rank times a scalar value. This is a scalar value, which is nice because it means that page rank is parallel to the pseudo rank in the strongly preferential case. So it's true that you cannot compute it exactly, but well, you can compute the pseudo rank and then normalize because after all, you know that page rank sums to one. So. Uh, Actually, it's true that page rank and pseudo rank have no relation because there is this strange factor here. But after all, you, you don't care about this strange factor. You compute the pseudo rank and then normalize. And this is what was suggested uh, at some point. But sorry. Oh, no, I didn't write it here. Ah, no, it, it was suggested at some point by Del Corso, Gulli, and Romani. Uh, and it means that when computing page rank, you can forget about dangling nodes. Actually, up to this point, I have assumed that you first patch the dangling nodes and then you start computing page rank. This is not true. You can forget about the dangling nodes. What you get is that is a, is a vector that will not sum up to one. That is the pseudo rank. But then you normalize and you get page rank. So this is what uh, Del Corso, Gulli, and Romani suggested. Forget about dangling nodes. Just compute page rank, actually pseudo rank, and then at the end normalize. Or normalize at every, at every step, if you prefer. So there is no way, if you want to compute a strongly preferential version of page rank, there is no reason to take dangling nodes into consideration. They will only serve to uh, keep the values summing up to one. But if you don't care, you just keep on computing, and then at the end you renormalize. This is what the formula here says. You following me? OK. You must be very tired. I'm, I'm quite tired now. So very briefly, um, page rank is only one of many ranking techniques based on links. Uh, there are many others. So in the, in the course of time, many people suggested alternative ways to compute ranking functions that depend on links. One such uh, example is, was proposed by Kleinberg more or less in the same time as page rank, so 98, 99. And it was called HITS. Actually, it was much less fortunate than Google, than page rank, probably because Kleinberg didn't create Google. But uh, HITS is, is interesting. And uh, um, there are many uh, others. One is called salsa. Uh, salsa is, uh, was invented by Lempel and Moran. Salsa means stochastic something, stochastic analysis of links, uh, blah, blah. And so it's not, salsa is a nice acronym, but. 
I, I want to, pre to present briefly hits in the time that remains, or not. No, probably not. I have four minutes. I would have to run as fast as the light. So I prefer to present it at the beginning of the next class that will be tomorrow. Okay? You have questions f about this lesson? Ah, uh, all, the all the slides I, I have presented, I have sent also, also to the organizers and they will give you the PDFs. But uh, I ask them to give you the PDFs only after the classes. So they will give the PDF of this lesson today. This is what I want, but they will decide what to do, okay? <laughs>